Hey, how's it going? You know, I've mentioned before how Dyson Swarms are a really good idea for civilizations to build, provided they're technologically capable of building them, but it's kind of hard to really get across the enormity of the power these things can produce. I mean, that's the general problem with space things, right? They're so immense that words kind of lose all meaning. It's why we all like those videos that contextualize how big the Earth is next to the Sun, next to a supergiant star, next to a nebula, next to a galaxy, next to how strangely down bad I am for that one SpaceX launch presenter if that was somehow a physical object. Anyway, Dyson Swarms are truly worthy of any attention they get, because the power that just one of these things would pump out would be insane. Even if we built one out of duct tape and dog sh it would still give us godlike power. So today I'm going to be doing some very loose back of the notepad type calculations to illustrate just how hilariously overpowered these things really are. All right, let's get to it. So what exactly is a Dyson Swarm? Well, it's basically a cluster of satellites surrounding a star. A big cluster. A very big cluster. We're talking probably quadrillions of satellites, at least. If each satellite is basically a thin sheet of film that either collects light or reflects it to a focus point somewhere else where it can be collected, there's theoretically enough mass in the solar system to build one, at least provided you aren't a big fan of Mercury. Now, Dyson Swarms aren't the only possible thing a future civilization could use as a power source. I tend to assume Dyson Swarm technology will dominate energy production eventually, at least when you're nearest star, and artificial fusion will dominate when you're trying to operate somewhere more remote. There's also other options. Conventional chemical reactions are never going to go completely out of fashion, and other power generation technologies that we already use, like nuclear fission, wind, hydro, geothermal, will probably remain useful in niche circumstances, even in the far future. Same as how lighting a fire is still useful for us to keep us warm, but you know, most people aren't setting up a campfire in their living room. There's also more exotic ideas, like harnessing energy from dropping things into black holes, or balancing feeding a black hole with it giving off the ideal amount of Hawking radiation, and boy, that could go sideways if we Chernobyl it. There's also antimatter, which is theoretically a perfectly efficient energy source, although you'd need to manufacture and store the antimatter in the first place, which I'd hazard a guess is probably always going to cost more energy than what it ultimately releases anyway. So I think of antimatter more like a ridiculously powerful, highly unstable, and incredibly explosive battery if you think about it. Anyway, I think Dyson Swarms are going to be doing a lot of humanity's heavy lifting when we actually get to the point of being able to build them. I'm not going to be rigorously proving that Dyson Swarms are the best option in this video because that would require an in-depth analysis of every single potential power source and quite frankly I'm bored just saying that sentence out loud. So instead I'm going to give you a vibe for how stupidly powerful Dyson Swarms are. I'm going to attempt some simple maths, hopefully not completely balls it up and embarrass myself, although that's definitely a possibility, and then we can just vibe out how powerful a Dyson Swarm is based on how many dogs it could pat at once or something. Sorry to interrupt, this is just a quick message to say statistically speaking you're probably not subscribed, so I'll make you a deal. Press the subscribe button and I won't come over to your house and do this. Alright, thanks. Back to the video. It's easy to forget how powerful the sun is, at least it is for me, as someone who lives in a part of the world that causes my nipples to cut holes in my shirt every time I walk outside, but I got back from Barcelona late last week, and let me tell you, the sun does indeed exist. In fact, if you've got my skin complexion, it helps you do a pretty good lobster impression. By the way, this isn't relevant at all, but I thought I'd just point out, if you ever go and check out the back doors of the Sagrada Familia, you'll see that the legendary architect Antoni Gaudi was indeed a based Zandros fan, which explains why the bust of him in the basement depicts him as a Giga Chad. Anyway, with any luck, the sun will be almost as powerful as what an all patatas bravas diet does to a man. Ryanair had to break out the tech priests and consecrate the shit on the way back after what I did to it. By the way, who the f*** is Ryan? Sorry, I keep getting distracted. Okay, so specifically how powerful would a Dyson Swarm be? Well, these are going to be very loose numbers. We're talking back of the notepad, basic maths. I'm not doing any insanely complicated calculus type shit. I'm also going to use some pretty conservative numbers because we don't want to assume everything's going to be shiny and perfect. We should assume everything is about as shit as it can possibly be and then see what numbers we can still get out of this. We're just getting a feel for things. This should feel less NASA and more Kerbal Space Program. So let's imagine we only build a partial Dyson Swarm. In fact, let's assume we only get 1% coverage. For every 100 photons that leave the sun, we collect one of them, and 99 of them get away. So this would basically be a really thin scattering of satellites around the sun, probably looking like a sphere or a torus shape, except it's so sparse that you couldn't actually physically see it with your eyes from a distance. We could arrange these solar satellites to be periodic in such a way, which means that it wouldn't affect the sunlight reaching the Earth at all, although I don't think a 1% dip in luminosity 
luminosity would really do much to the biosphere on Earth anyway. The solar irradiance received by the Earth already varies by about 7% per year just because of the Earth's orbit being elliptical. Okay, so we're intercepting 1% of the sun's light with our Dyson Swarm. Now let's say, of the light that we collect, we only actually harness 10% of it, right? We're 10% efficient, which is shitter than the efficiency we can already manage with solar panels. But again, I'm just keeping it nice round numbers and staying conservative. Keep in mind, realistically, if we need this many panels, you could imagine resource bottlenecks might limit us to using less efficient technologies than we're theoretically capable of, just because maybe we don't have the physical materials to build quintillions of something that's as sophisticated as something we could make if we were only making 10 of them. So we're going to say we're harnessing energy a bit badly and we're getting 10% efficiency. Seems plausible. So the overall energy budget for our civilization, or at least for the bits of our civilization we power with the Dyson Swarm, is 10% of 1% of the sun's total output right? Okay, lastly, let's just focus on one sector that we might want to use the energy on, right? That'll make things easier to talk about. Specifically, how much stuff could we transport with this energy? Well, globally, we, as in modern day humanity, use about 20 to 30% of our energy on transportation. That's the fuel we burn in our cars, in our trains, in our planes. So let's say that we only use 10% of our Dyson Swarm energy budget on space transportation specifically. So that would still leave 15 to 20% for on-world transit. Any other remaining 70%-ish we can just use for other bullshit, right? Computing, construction, manufacturing, making bacon sandwiches, whatever. So if you think about it, what we really want to know is what's 10% of 10% of 1% of the sun's output. That's the amount of energy that this hypothetical future human civilization would have to use on pushing stuff around in space. Okay, so total solar luminosity is 3.828 times 10 to the 26 watts. We're looking for one one hundredth of 1% 1 of that, which is 3.828 times 10 to the 22 watts. Now, that's our answer in terms of power, but like, how much can you move with that? It's like having 10 trillion Vietnamese dong. Like, can I buy a mobile suit or a pencil sharpener with this? Well, let's make this easy to work out. Let's say that the spaceships that we have are all driven by photon sails. These would be really efficient and also makes the calculation very simple. If our Dyson Swarm collects light with a huge Dyson Swarm cluster of what are basically solar panels, and then it turns that energy into laser light, this civilization could have a network of mirrors that reflects those laser beams to where they need to be in order to push our spacecraft around in the way that we want them to. Of course, you could could just build a Dyson Swarm that directly reflects the sunlight to where you need it on the photon sails, instead of collecting it, converting it to lasers, and then shining the lasers on the sails. But I feel like the efficiency losses from trying to direct sunlight and having it inevitably spread out over time are going to be way more than just taking the energy and making a laser with it, because those lasers are going to be a lot more capable of staying in a narrow beam over huge distances. So I'm just intuiting that this is going to be the more efficient way to do things. For our numbers today, it doesn't even really matter. I'm just trying to make sense of what we're talking about. And again, to keep things simple, I'm assuming that that 10% efficiency value that we have accounts for everything. Like basically what I'm saying is 10% of the energy hitting our Dyson Swarm panels ends up as laser energy making it to the photon sail of our spacecraft. Now laser light still diverges eventually, so that value could actually still be pretty optimistic, but again I'm just trying to keep the numbers simple. If you want to make this calculation even more conservative, just divide all the numbers I get at the end by 10 or 100 again. The great thing is that Dyson Swarms are so insane that the numbers you'll get are still pretty nuts. Okay, Okay, so now let's work out how much force we can generate with the setup. See, when light hits an object, the force that that light exerts on that object is equal to the luminosity of the light divided by the speed of light. Why? Trust me, bro. Although technically, if you're using light to accelerate an object, there's not just a force applied when the light hits the object, you also get force applied when the light is reflected from the object. Like, you get the change in momentum from the photon hitting you at the speed of light, and the same again from the photon leaving you at the speed of light. So if we're sensible, we'll design the photon sails on our ships to be mirrors so that we can direct all those photons directly away from the ship and basically double the amount of force we get out of the entire setup. Then again, we are being conservative, so let's assume that our spaceships are shoddily built by China old laborers whose hands are regularly dipped in jam or some sh**. So let's say our mirrors are less than perfect and they only reflect 50% of the light. Anyway, that calculation will give us the force that the entire Dyson Swarm can produce collectively. And then at the end, we're just going to hit them with the good old F equals MA and solve for the amount of mass that we're going to be able to push around. We'll have worked out how much force we have to play with in total. We're trying to work out the mass that we can be pushing at any given moment. And as for the acceleration, I mean, that's basically up to us. In reality, we could vary that from spaceship to spaceship depending on how many lasers we want to point to any given ship, but for the purposes of this thought exercise we can only get a meaningful answer as to how much mass we can accelerate if we settle on a value for how quickly we're accelerating it all. So let's just say we're accelerating all this shit at 1g, right? In other words, all the spaceships that we're accelerating are accelerating at the same rate that I would
would accelerate if you pushed me out of a hot air balloon. 1G is a frankly ridiculous amount of continuous acceleration to use for a space journey. If you accelerated something at 1G, you can have it up to near light speed within like a year or so. It's totally unnecessary, but a Dyson Swarm is a frankly ridiculous idea in the first place, so hey ho, we're sticking with 1G. Alright, so provided my dumbass did this right, the Dyson Swarm could accelerate about 19 trillion kilograms at 1G simultaneously. Let's call it 20 trillion kilograms for ease. That's 20 billion metric tons. So what does that translate to? Well, you could continuously accelerate almost 4,000 Great Pyramids of Giza, or 45,000 Burj Khalifas, or 60,000 Empire State Buildings at 1G continuously and simultaneously. But bear in mind that those are all big, heavy structures. Buildings are not designed with weight saving as a super tight bottleneck, at least compared to aerospace structures. Like, you could make a spaceship the size of the Burj Khalifa with only like one one hundredth the mass of the Burj Khalifa. Well, at least until you put fuel in it, that's when things start to get heavy. But presuming for simplicity's sake that you're totally relying on those photon sails, you could use most of that mass and volume on creating raw living space, which could create huge ships which are very light for how big they are. For more comparisons, the Dyson Swarm could provide 1G of continuous acceleration to 44 and a half million international space stations, or 250 million space shuttle orbiters, or about 200 million Starship upper stages if you want to reference something modern. But these still have relatively small crude sections paired with fairly heavy structural elements or fuel tanks or aerodynamic surfaces that aren't going to be necessary on our photon sail ships, so there's not really any perfect apples to apples comparison that works very well between a photon sailor versus anything that already exists. I'm assuming our photon sail ships will probably look something like an O'Neill cylinder or a Stanford Taurus and just have a giant mirror on it. Also, bear in mind that we can vary this stuff. You can accelerate 20 ships weighing a billion tons each, or 2,000 ships weighing 10 million tons each, or 20 million ships weighing 1,000 tons each, or 2 billion ships weighing 10 tons each. Realistically, we'd have a mix, right? If we're a civilization with a Dyson Swarm, we'd have a load of small ships, a lot of medium ships, a decent number of massive ships, and maybe a few ultra-massive ones. In fact, if we imagine an interstellar civilization with this setup, like there's a few neighboring star systems with similar Dyson Swarms, a given system could probably use half of its space transportation energy budget on accelerating and decelerating interstellar ships into and out of the system, and the other half of that energy it could spend on moving ships around inside of the system. We could also gigantically increase the amount of mass we can accelerate simultaneously if we just lower the rate of acceleration that we're after. You don't actually need 1G of acceleration unless you need to get somewhere outrageously quickly. A third or a quarter of a G is probably plenty for most applications. Even 0.1G is probably fine. It'll still get you anywhere in the solar system a lot faster than we can currently get things there if you assume that the acceleration provided from the Dyson Swarm is continuous over a long duration. And if we're moving things around at 0.1G rather than 1G, you can increase the mass that you can simultaneously accelerate tenfold. And bear in mind, this huge number that we can accelerate, 20 billion metric tons, isn't the total amount of mass we can have in space. That number would be way higher. No, we're only talking about the fraction of mass that we have in space which is being actively accelerated at 1G at any given moment. So any interplanetary spacecraft which just gets up to speed and then drifts on a transfer orbit for a few days or weeks or months won't be using any of our energy budget during the cruise section. Any interstellar spacecraft, even one that accelerates at 1G for the course of a year and gets up to a really fast cruise speed, allowing it to reach another star system within the span of a single decade, still doesn't eat into our energy budget at all during the majority of the time that it's travelling. And if we have any space stations, if those are in a stable orbit, outside of any minor station keeping, which is probably better accomplished with onboard power anyway, those also won't chip away at our energy budget at all. And I'd argue that big space stations and megastructures and stuff are likely to make up the majority of the mass that a civilization like this would have in space. And that sort of stuff is only going to eat into our energy budget when we're moving them into position in the first place. But they're essentially free after that. So our actual space empire could easily be 20 trillion metric tons, just only accelerating bits of it at a time. Anyway, this is what space dorks like myself mean when we say that Dyson Swarms are so overpowered. To compare it to fiction, in Star Wars canon, the Galactic Empire, at its height, had 25,000 Star Destroyers. Now, if the Empire is anything like reality, most of these Star Destroyers won't be operational simultaneously. Let's say that 15,000 of them are operational at any given moment, with the rest of them undergoing maintenance. Each one canonically masses 40 million metric tons. Do the math, and in reality, you wouldn't need a galactic empire to provide the energy to operate all of them, not even to accelerate all of them at 1G simultaneously. You'd only need 30 star systems to do that. And that's 30 star systems equipped with our crappy, modern-day, plausible 1% coverage Dyson Swarm with 10% efficiency and only 10% of its output actually used on space travel. Like, imagine the energy available if the coverage was like 10% or 25% or 
or 100% instead of just 1%. Or if we got the efficiency up from 10% to like 50% or something. Or if we could use artificial fusion reactors to power almost everything else so that the Dyson Swarm energy budget for space transportation isn't just 10% of what we harness, but maybe it's closer to 70 or 80 or 100%. The amount of energy a single star has to offer is fucking mind blowing. And when you factor in how easily this technology would scale itself to near complete solar coverage given the available energy that even a crap one has, and then how much easier this technology makes interstellar travel, and then the fact that you can just do this in every star system in the galaxy, and then you can do that in every galaxy within the region of the universe we have the ability to causally influence, you have a recipe for a real intergalactic skibbity rizzlo bazinga moment, and that is how you ruin a video in the final sentence. Alright, that'll do it. Thanks as always to my elite level supporters, Thunderbolt 22A10, who can power a small city with the static electricity generated by his chest hair, Nomad Greg, who runs a black hole farm, it ain't much but it's honest work, Andrew Mall, who has such a sharp jawline he once turned his head too quickly and circumcised a house fly in midair, John Beharano, who plays snooker with Dyson Spheres on the weekend because he's actually an omniscient being made of pure light energy, JDK Zero Derso, who accidentally produced the wow signal back when he was trying to microwave some pasta in the Ohio State University canteen back in 1977, and thanks to all my other supporters too, don't forget to join the Patreon or the channel membership if you want to be featured in my video credits or chat on Discord, and as always, I'll catch you in the next one. Over and out.